All right, so we begin to talk on one of the basic tissues um, in the human body, which is epithelium. Remember, there's the basic tissues. You have connective tissue, then you have nerve, then you have muscle, things that we'll cover in, uh, in a separate talk. All right, so epithelium basically is um, that part of connective tissue that covers your body surfaces as well as the body cavities. And when it covers these body surfaces, it's going to cover from the external uh, as well as from the internal aspect of um, the human body. And you also expect to see epithelium forming the parenchyma or most likely the glandular part for, for most organs, which is going to be the functional part. And when you look at this tissue, it's quite unique that um, it's avascular, so there are no blood vessels within epithelium. The same thing that you expect to find when you do your cartilage, even when you do your lens, um, when you do the eye. So how does it get its um, nutrients and oxygen? Since it's avascular, remember all epithelial cells are going to rest on a, on a basement membrane. Um, others would like to say basal lamina, but uh, basement membrane will be basal lamina plus reticular lamina. But remember, you don't always have a reticular lamina. Right? So all cells rest on a basement membrane. Um, that's the statement that I'm going to use. And below the basement membrane, you can now expect connective tissue. And when you cover connective tissue in a separate talk, you find that most of the blood vessels that you have will actually be within the connective tissue and they allow for some form of diffusion from that connective tissue, which we appropriately refer to as lamina propria when we do most of the, when we do most of the organs. Uh, that's where you now expect things to actually uh, diffuse from. Right. And in between your epithelial cells, you don't expect to have any intercellular space because your cells are going to be tightly joined together. And what's going to tightly join the cells together is more likely going to be tight junctions as well as desmosomes. Whereas hemidesmosomes are those that are going to tether your epithelial cells towards the basal lamina so that you don't have detachment. So there again, when you now see detachment of your epithelial cells from the basal lamina, that is going to give um, some form of um, uh, pathology, which is uh, bullous pemphigoid, for example, which you remember by saying PhD. When you say PhD, the HD there is, uh, uh, is, uh, is referring to hemidesmosomes, then the P is pemphigoid. Then the other one is pemphigus for guys, where you have a problem with uh, desmosomes. So this one you remember by saying PV. So the PV there will be uh, pemphigus for guys, then the D, uh, it's desmosomes. There's a way to remember, especially when you now do uh, skin histology or your skin epithelium, right? And all epithelial cells are going to exhibit what we call polarity. So you're going to have a basal end, then you're also going to have an apical end. And things that are going to be on the apical surface will not mix with things that are going to be on your um, on your uh, basal end. So this is what we call functional and morphologic polarity, right? So different functions are associated with uh, different domains. For example, there's the free surface or the apical domain, there's the lateral domain, then there's the basal domain in which all you ascribe different, different functions, right? And basically for us to classify epithelium, remember, you're going to have a free surface, you're going to have all the cells lining on the basement membrane and the likes, but there are certain instances where you don't have a free surface. This is where epithelial cells or epithelial-like cells will lack a free surface. We we'll refer to this as epithelioid, uh, epithelioid tissue, something that you can be talk about when you do um, granulomas and whatever, when you do your histopathology, right? So epithelioid, oid, uh, the suffix oid would mean like, epithelioid, so it's epithelium-like, but they lack, uh, they lack a free surface, right? And then in terms of epithelial classification, um, remember we talk about um, either epithelium being simple or stratified. When it's simple, this is where you have one cell. When it's stratified, you have two or more cell layers. Then we have an in-between, which is pseudo-stratified, Pseudo means false. So when it's false, um, we expect to have we expect to have um, uh, 
something that looks like it's stratified. So you expect to see some form of nuclei that are at different levels, but they are not uh, they are not uh, all resting on different layers. So it's one layer with cells that are of different height that's going to be pseudo stratified. But in another instance is you may have two types of cells with alternating heights. We refer to that as a scalloped epithelium, something that you see when you do your a male reproductive system within the efferent ductus, uh, the epithelium that you have there. Then in terms of cell shape, well, we have squamous, which is almost flat. Then remember a squam, that's flat. Then you have cuboidal, where it's that's the same width, depth, whatever. Then you have columina, which are quite taller uh, as compared to their width, right? Then, so this type of... Um, classifications, you can now say it's a simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple stra simple columnar, stratified cuboidal, stratified columnar, stratified whatever, so the stratified whatever. So all this comes from, from, from the height. So the basement membrane, like I say, that's where all the epithelial cells rest. You have a basal lamina mostly made of type 4 collagen. Then you have a reticular lamina mostly made of um, reticular fibers, which are your type 3, uh, type 3 collagen. Right. Then when you now look at cell types, so I usually say um, common sense first, because the moment you know that something is simple, for example, it's one cell led, then you say it's flat, meaning squamous, you now expect that to be in regions where you want uh, diffusion to happen quicker or faster. Right. For example, alveoli, you want to have gas exchange at um, a rapid rate. So that means you need to be able to you need to be able to have a cell that is quite thin and allow for maximum movement of those things. The same can be said for the kidney glomerulus, where you want there to be some form of filtration. Right. These are not the only places where you have simple squamous. It's many more. I'll show you a picture towards the end of uh, the mesovarium of the ovary, where you see some simple squamous cells coupled with some adipose tissue. I'll show you the picture shortly. Right. Then... Uh, simple cuboidal, or maybe simple collamina first. Where you see simple collamina, we think about the gastrointestinal tract, uh, with the exception of the esophagus and the lower half of the anal canal, where the epithelium is more likely going to be stratified squamous. Then um, you also expect to see simple cuboidal within the kidney um, nephron, most likely the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule, where you want to have some form of secretion and reabsorption happening, which brings us to a point which you must then remember, what are the functions of epithelium? Besides epithelium being protective, covering the surfaces, it is a barrier, it's going to be absorptive, it's going to be secretory, it's going to be sensory. So all those things, they encompass the functions of epithelium, right? Then pseudostratified collamina, that's respiratory epithelium mostly. Um, uh, 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 then you have stratified squamous where you want there to be protection because when it's stratified, remember you expect to have uh, more than two cell layers. So when you have more than two cell layers, that's going to be uh, stratified. So expect that in skin, expect that in the oral cavity, in the esophagus. But then what differs now is, is it keratinized stratified squamous or non-keratinized? For example, when it's skin, it's going to be a keratinized stratified epithelium that is going to have five layers, which you come to do when you do your skin histology. Right? Then we have a special form of stratified epithelium, which we call urothelium or just transitional epithelium. This is the epithelium that we see in the bladder, um, the prostatic part of the urethra. Uh, we also see this in the proximal part of the female urethra. We also see this in the ureters, going back to the renal pelvis in the kidney. This epithelium has three cell layers, a basal layer where there are stem cells, uh, a middle layer where there are about three to five columnar cells, columnar, columnar to cuboidal cells. Then you have a, um, an apical domain where uh, you now expect to have umbrella shaped or dome shaped or bulbous shaped cells um, within that surface right then stratified collamina back then i just used to say collamina conjunctiva cuboidal we think about ducts and the glands 
So most of the DAGs that you expect to have in clients, they're going to have stratified cuboidal. But then it's not cast in stone that every DAG will have such because, if, for example, you now do parotid DAG, pancreatic DAG, then you start to relay different information. So most of the DAGs have stratified cuboidal, but it's not every DAG that is going to have stratified cuboidal. That's the point that I'm trying to drive at. And then... Um, we, we have what we call apical modifications, um, apical surface modifications for, for, for these epithelial cells. We have microvilli, which are finger-like um, cytoplasmic uh, projections. These finger-like cytoplasmic projections that will be on the apical surface of um, epithelial cells made up of a core of actin filaments uh, they're about one micrometer uh, long and 0 0.1 micrometers in diameter. And they help with increasing the absorptive surface area. So expect this way you want absorption. For example, within the gastrointestinal tract, we're going to see microvilli. When you go to the kidneys, within the proximal convoluted tube, we're also going to see microvilli because you want there to be some form of uh, reabsorption. When you get to the distal convoluted tube, since most of the reabsorption would have happened in the PCT, you now expect the microvilli to be less. They're going to be irregular in, in shape, and that um, uh, doesn't give him a brush border appearance. But where you see microvilli, usually you expect to see uh, a brush border. We call it a brush border or a striated border. Right? Then we also talk about stereocilia. They're about 0 0.2 micrometers in diameter. They are unusually long. Um, they are actually longer than your microvilli, but they are just immortal microvilli. Right. So you also then have um, what you call cilia. So stereocilia, you expect this in the epithelium, means the vast difference. That's the male reproductive system. Then the inner ear, we have a specialized stereocilia, which is for neuro, uh, neurosensory. Right. Then um, Cilia is just an array of microtubules, uh, which provide a beating action for motility. So expect this in the respiratory system where we'll say there's a pseudostratified ciliated column epithelium. When we do the female reproductive system, we'll also see cilia within your, within your uh, uterine tubes. When we do the male reproductive system, we'll also see cilia within the efferent ductus to help propel the developing sperm as they move towards the epididmis uh, for storage and um, whatever. Right. Okay. So uh, these are now just uh, pictures that um, tell us a bit about epithelium. Nothing fancy about them. Um, so uh, I'll do this from top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Then we we move on just like that, right? So the picture on the top left there, that's um that's simple squamous epithelium. There's some form of elongated nucleus which looks flat. Uh, this is what we call meso. Um, uh, this is just uh, the mesovarium that you expect to see within the ovary, right? So this is just uh, simple squamous epithelium. Then you also have um, then you also have um, these white spaces, which are your adipocytes. So when you, when you now see when you now see um, uh, the empty space that appear whitish, that's um, adipocytes, right? Then. This again is simple squamous epithelium. Um, I, I'll not talk about this since this is not H and E staining. This is um, silver impregnation. I uh, remember some staining you can use um, silver when the tissue is arigophilic, right? This is a, um, a picture of um, uh, the kidney glomerulus. So here we can see simple squamous epithelium uh, in these regions. Uh, the whitish space in between there, that's your urinary space. You come to learn this when you do your renal uh, your renal system. Then this is a simple cuboidal. And this is just um, a pancreatic uh, duct. Um, so this is simple cuboidal epithelium. You can see how the nuclei are arranged there. Right. Then this here is simple cuboidal epithelium. That's just uh, liver tissue. These are hepatocytes. So that's again simple cuboidal. Um, this is the lung, I'll skip this, but this is lung tissue. I'm also showing a bit of simple cuboidal within the proximal uh, um, upper respiratory tract, right? 
Then this picture here, this is um, the exocrine pancreas where we see asnat tissue. Right, this is just um, showing us some form of simple epithelium. Uh, this year, these are what we call proximal convoluted tubules. So remember I said proximal convoluted tubules, you expect to have simple cuboid epithelium. So when you see the nucleus, you expect now to see the nucleus a bit um, almost um, like a cube and the cell is, uh, uh, the cell is its length and its whatever um, width, they're almost the same. And that's simple cuboid epithelium. Maybe hard when you're studying the basics to realize that this is a proximal convoluted tubule. Um, this year, this is um, a human colon. Um, you can see goblet cells here. Goblet cells are unicellular, um, unicellular mucus secreting cells that can be found interspaced among epithelial cells, giving a pseudostratified appearance in other cases. Right, so this is your, um, this is your. This is your goblet cells, yeah. Right. Um, then when you come here, this is another goblet cell, yeah. Now I think you can see that these cells, there are cells on the basal end, yeah, which we call basal cells, then there are cells that appear a bit longer. There's a columnar, then you have cells that are the apical ends there. So this is a respiratory epithelium. It is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. When you come to do your respiratory system, you expect to find five types of cells there, for example, the granule cells, the bright cells, the columnar cells, the goblet cells, and the basal cells, right? Then this again is pseudostratified epithelium. This is a picture that I took from uh, the epididmis. Then this is a classic picture of stratified squamous. So this is a picture from the vagina. Uh, this is non-keratinized because we are not seeing any keratin there, but we can see the layers there. There are about five layers, like I said, where you have a stratum basalis, stratum corneum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, stratum spinosum, you name it, right? Um, this picture here shows us two different things. On this end here, um, we can see esophageal tissue. That's um, stratified squamous. On the other end here, we can see some form of stratified cuboidal, which is just belonging to the ducts that are serving to drain the glands within the esophagus. But here we can see stratified squamous, which is the, the, the whole reason why I put this picture here. This is um, stratified again. I'll skip. This is transitional epithelium. I must say transitional epithelium has superficial um, umbrella-shaped cells. Then you have the middle layer of three to five columnar to cuboidal cells. Then you have the basal cells, right? Then this picture here just shows us some form of epithelial transition where you can see some stratified epithelium. Then you have some simple columnar on the other end there, right? So that's just um, epithelium in uh, a nutshell.